So, we're here with Ogre after the Repo Shadow Cast. So, it is your second time coming here to Sacramento for the Shadow Cast. So, um, how's this time different than the first? Um, well, obviously, I, I had a little more of, a, of a, a, an expectation of what was going to happen a little bit, but there's still lots of uh, unique experiences within the production that made it uh, wonderful. And I think this is one of the best casts that I've been, you know, top five casts that I've seen in my travels. So it's always a pleasure to come back here and kind of see somebody um, put a new take on things. And I think this show in particular doesn't distract from the film and also keeps your eye off the film in a lot of ways, if that makes any sense, because of what's going on stage. It's a very kind of complex stage show, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, it, it both pays tribute, makes fun of, and uh, and you know, you laugh along with it, you laugh, you laugh, laugh at it, but you don't, you know, you don't laugh at yourself. <laughs> So what, what was it about this one that drew you back? Did you go see other shadow casts more than once? Well, I mean, I, well, I mean you know, Tim, Tim invited me back, for one thing, so um, it was hard to say no to that. And, uh, and yeah, when I'm at conventions, I, I, I tend to see whatever shadow cast is happening at, at, at like the different conventions. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's varied. I've seen about, I think, four or five different groups and, uh, in my convention running, my horror convention running. I didn't say horror, I said horror <laughs> convention. So why do you think um, Repo has inspired people to recreate it in Shadowcast? Well, I think um, there's there's a lot of aspects to it. I think there's the, the songs themselves kind of lend themselves to a, a sing-along sort of thing. The story uh, is set up like a, a two-act opera where there's a lot of exposition where people can participate in. And in the second half, the shit hits the fan kind of in a way. So it's kind of set up in a theatrical fashion. No. The theater obviously involves an audience, so um, I, I see it, uh, you know, transferring that. Had I, had I in my wildest dreams thought that this would have happened with Repo, after it was released, no. So it's, it's something that I think the fans kind of took on their own and, and made their own, so it, it was surprising to me. A pleasant surprise. No. <laughs> obviously. What's the best part about coming out to events like this and interacting with um, all the people that love you so much? Well, that's the best part. You know, it's not, it isn't so much about loving me so much, but in this case, they, they love the character, um, which is different um, than, than something going on where people are coming to see Skinny Puppy or, or, or things like that. And I, I, think, I think for me, I, you know, I, I always had a bit of a, a barrier between uh, going out and doing things publicly and talking to people and the character that I portray on stage. And I always kind of thought I needed to keep those separate. And I think transferring to film gave me the opportunity to kind of push through that, that, that paper wall. And, uh, and you know, I have found that a lot of these people are wonderful people, obviously. They're all wonderful people. And uh, the horror community especially is, is a very kind of soft-spoken and very close kind of unique group. So, I mean, I always embrace, you know, outsiders. We're all kind of outside. We're all broken toys. You know, I see it as, as we're all here doing something because we love doing it. And so, this is especially special because it's not really about me. It's about the character that's celebrating the film. So, I think that makes it even kind of more special for me. Um, well, we were going through an insolvency with our record label when uh, we um, not really started the album, but we were about halfway through and we were about to tour. And we were supposed to be touring that album. And so um, we have a lot of things that kind of happened uh, within the recording process of a Skinny Puppy record that both um, derails and sometimes fuels the process. And in this case, um, a lot of time elapsed and kind of went back to when we recorded the process. And uh, that was a bit a bit daunting and a bit debilitating and, and uh, in some ways kind of, at first I thought, took the project off track from what we were trying to, to do. And, uh, it wasn't until I listened to it about a month before I started doing it, actually a couple of weeks before I started, started, started doing press, that I kind of heard it in its entirety and, and uh, related to it a lot more. So I think it found its way um, in the midst of all the chaos. And I think uh, as we stand now in the world, it's, it's, a, it's an appropriate album to release. It might not be the most welcome album in the sense that it's, um, 
it's not necessarily a positive album. I mean, it's 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 something that for me is is just kind of the culmination of of 26 years of looking at trends um, politically. Um, environmentally and, uh, and socially and seeing a lot of horrible things and talking about it and it, it isn't like you're some prophet that's right or wrong but when, when things start happening in the way that you foresaw them uh, it, it makes you kind of sad and at the same time I mean, it gives me it gives me all the impetus to keep writing too if that makes any sense <laughs> that's bittersweet bittersweet at best so the press release for Handover um you say there's an overarching theme of it over and take it, which I found very um, funny. And it also um, said that it mirrors today's cultural uncertainty that you were just touching on. So to me, that kind of sounds like the album is more of a political and social commentary than it is like something personal. Well, it is. It is. It is in a way, but it's but it's from the perspective of somebody who's who doesn't have apathy necessarily, but is 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 resigned to what's happening. So. Um, I think in a lot of ways the um, there's there's a sense of impotency and the anger because no matter how much anger one puts out it, it's only it's only um, it's only negating what's going to happen further in a lot of ways it's, it's like it's allowing the negation to continue so I think that you know the idea that I had in the 80s of having a loud voice or being you know talking about things strongly or with uh, you know with, with a big stick and trying to wake people up that way is, is happening anyway. So it, it becomes more of a voice that's, uh, that's more reflective a little bit and, and is, uh, is less, uh, less trying to stir things up. You know, even I think one of the, the hardest songs on the record is Village, yeah. which again is, is, uh, is, is a, bit, it's a bit scornful and a bit, um, you know, a bit condescending in the sense of like, ha ha ha, you, know, you asked for it, you got it. You know? It's my favorite song. And one of my favorite songs too on the record, and and, uh, and that that I think sums up the anger part of it. But the rest is, is kind of reflective and a bit sad, you know, a bit sad with, with what's happening. And, yeah, kind of hopeless almost. And a bit hopeless, and it's a bit it's a bit how you know we feel as a band sometimes. It's a bit jittery, a bit you know, unsure of what's next. You know, not that Skinny Puppy's ever known what's next. We've never we've never had a clear path. We've never had a, a an easy road. And we've led a very bohemian sort of uh, lifestyle with it all. And so, in a way, you know, we don't feel disenfranchised because we've been dealing with this all the time. But you start seeing it all around you, and it's disconcerting in a way. You don't, you don't feel like, ha ha, now, now you're feeling it. You kind of feel uh, it's different than anything else I've felt in my life. And uh, to where I don't know. You know, before I could kind of predict things and, and, and you know, adjust to, to what's happening. But in the new world, I don't even know what my place is. Right now. I, I question that sometimes. But, you know, it's an unknown. Not that I can't deal with it, but it's still, it's still an unknown. Because things are happening at such, you know, a magnified, quicker, and all together things are happening. And, uh, and that's unique, you know, uh, for, for, the, for, for at least my lifetime, you know. Maybe not people during the Great Depression, but it's, it's definitely a unique time for me. You know, you know. Unknown. Also in the press release, Kevin Key said that um, his quote was he didn't want to write the record the same way as the previous ones. So does that mean you guys had a new approach? I mean, kind of. I mean, the, the, the approach is a bit mythmakery, um, even though I'm, I, 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 I kind of understand what Kevin's saying, although, you know, Mythmaker kind of went back to more his compositions. And Greater Wrong was kind of a lot of, um, a lot more influence from Mark and I, and maybe the, to where it sounded a bit like Ogre, a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, Mythmaker was kind of half and half, and this album definitely goes back to <coughs> embracing his compositions with, with, with very little overdubs musically. And then I kind of went back into um, more of a stream of consciousness um, lyric writing thing, or just what I used to do as a child, I used to sit down and just write a page of words and then pick out um, phrases and then put those together. So I kind of went back to that for this record, which again gave me kind of the jittery feeling because I didn't know if what I was writing made any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it did to me. <laughs> so, out of curiosity, um, there's a track called Brownstone. Mm -hmm. Does that relate at all to your Mr. Brownstone? Character? Yes, absolutely. It's the um, it's the uh, the conception of Brownstone. Uh, Mr. Brownstone came from that song. That song was a off the head um, um, rant. 
basically. You know, it was a one take rant. There was no editing on the vocal, and uh, or, or really there wasn't even that many vocal effects on it. It was all just my voice and uh, a weird voice that I got into, and then and then a stream of consciousness rant, which I'm, I was very happy with. So it, it almost. Uh, if, if you guys know Velvet Underground, if you listen to any Velvet Underground, I, I used to love a song called, I don't remember, I think it was, on, it was off the album White, White Heat, White Light, White Heat, uh, called The Gift. And I'm not sure if it's off the album, but uh, if you've heard that song, it's like, a, it's basically it's a boyfriend sending himself to his girl in a, in a package. And, uh, and when he arrives at the end, she's so excited, she punches it open with a, with, a, with a big pair of scissors and it goes right through the box squarely through his head into his brain and the last thing is like little blobs of blood you know floating out of the box or something so it was, it was very much in that spirit so. so it's not really a fair question to ask you this I don't think it's fair to ask any artist really but what's your favorite um, song offhand over offhand over well, I've told you already it's, it's, yeah, it's Village um, would, would be my favorite although um, Overt uh, the, the first song has kind of grown on me a lot and uh and Ictums, uh, I, I like a lot. I mean, there's, there's a few off it I, I really like. There's, I, the, I, the, my, my least favorite song on, on the record, if you want to go for that, would be Point. Only because I, I was involved in the vocal effect of that song, and they put this horrible harmonizer. <laughs> it's funny to hear you say you don't like it. Well, I mean, I, it isn't I don't like it. It's just that, you know, within Skinny Puppy, there's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's music, not by committee necessarily, but there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's more of a collaboration, so there's more give and take more give and take now than there ever has been. So as opposed to getting really pissed off about it and freaking out like I used to, uh, it was more it was more allowing uh, the artist, you know, whoever it was, Ken, Ken who mixed it and found the effect, it just, just letting it be. And, you know, and, and I'm sure I'll find, I'll find enjoyment at the same time. That's just being totally honest. I love the whole album. It's great. It's excellent. It's been a busy year for you releasing two albums, one with Skinny Puppy, one with Ogre. And um, press release said you guys, you're going to be touring. So um, tell me about that. Uh, Skinny Puppy's touring in, in spring, for sure. Uh, and probably farther than we've ever gone before. And, uh, and Ogre, I'm just trying to work out a little West Coast tour for December. That I find out about next week, so I can't really announce it. But if it happens, it'll be happening between December second and the sixteenth up the West Coast. West Coast, so could involve Sacramento, possibly. Probably not Sacramento. Don't say that. Don't say that. Maybe unless, unless I can convince Tim to book that. Yes, I'll help you. Okay, well, talk to Tim. <laughs>
myself. It was music. So I went back and saw OMD, and it was great. I even liked all the new songs, the pop songs. So. <laughs> Shoot me in the head. But it was great. It was, it was a really great show. The sound was amazing. It was a good, it was a good. And I think the show before that was Gary Newman. So.